Hey, Nerdy Knitters, welcome to another episode of the Nerdy Knitting Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Get your favorite beverage and your knitting, and let's settle in and have a good chat. Let's start with some knitting news, and I've got a few bits of interesting news today, or things that I've seen. The first is a YouTube video, of course, here on YouTube. Sockmetician has released a video recently about a Neater SSK. It doesn't do any fancy tricks or anything like that, or twisting stitches to get it neater. It just does one simple thing, and I'm really impressed with the way he's looked at the stitches and devised this, and it's such a simple fix. If you ever thought about when you knit and knit two together, Usually the floppy stitch is underneath, it's hidden, so you don't see it. The really neat stitch is on top, but when you knit an SSK, it looks messier. It never looks as good as the knit two together because that floppier stitch ends up on top. So he has this, just this neat little trick where you basically pull some of that excess yarn out of the first stitch when you're working the second stitch before it comes off your needle you just give it a little tug to tighten up the top stitch and it just makes it so much neater so i'll put a link here you can check out that video it's really a great way very simple no tricks just an, a great way to neaten up that ssk the next bit of knitting news is from drexel university they're working on some knitted fabric technology the, the title of the article Topo Knit System lays the groundwork for universal design of functional fabrics. So if you've ever heard of functional fabrics or um, technology embedded into fabrics, like for military gear, sometimes in like really high fashion items, it's usually not added to the fabric itself, but it's added after. But, um, but David Breen, he's a professor at Drexel, he's been computer modeling fabric since the 90s, and he's created a set of algorithms that model the path of the yarn. I'm going to read an excerpt from the article. Before 3D printing, CNC routing, laser cutting, and the tools of ubiquitous making, there was yarn and needles. For centuries, the earliest makers knitted things into being. Blankets, sweaters, gloves, all took shape by combining just a handful of basic stitches. Now a team of researchers at Drexel University is translating those loops and twists into a digital architecture of knitting, a key step in the process of incorporating new technologies into textiles. I thought that was such an interesting thing that they're doing all of this research into knitting and computerizing it, but not just to create more fabrics, but to create technology-based fabrics for the future, I guess. It feels very futuristic, but I'll link to the article. It's got some great pictures there about how the this these algorithms that they're creating work to follow the path of knitting, something that we've been doing with our yarn and needles. And the last little bit of news is something I saw on Facebook this week. Somebody posted in one of the groups I'm in that um, her sister uses a toothbrush holder with the separate little slots in it to hold like her most used notions like scissors, some needles perhaps, and things like that. I thought that was a really cute idea. That's it for our bits of knitting news and on to our knitting questions. And of course, if you have any comments or thoughts or opinions to share about the news or thoughts about the questions that I'm going to be answering, please leave them. I love your insight and to hear about your input. I certainly don't know everything about knitting and it's nice to see what other people have to say and their thoughts and opinions too. So the first question is from Michelle. When knitting cables, do you prefer to use metal or wooden needles? I still use my Chowgu four inch tips interchangeables for almost everything. I do have a scrap blanket in a project bag that I work on occasionally. I should pull that out and show it one week. Um, I do use straight needles for that just because it's small and it's more of an ongoing project and I don't want to keep one of my needles or my cables. I do have a few extra cable cords for my interchangeables, but not that many. So I do use straight needles for that project. But anyway, that's not even answering the question. I still use my chow goose for everything, every type of project. Occasionally I do use a cable needle if I need it. I've learned to work cables without a cable needle for the most part, but sometimes you've got cables that are crossing two different directions with like a purl stitch in the middle. So I need a cable needle for that type of cable and I'll use a small metal or I have a little wooden one I use sometimes, but no, I, I still prefer my slick needles. I think too, because sometimes cables can get tight sitting on the needles and I prefer the slicker material for that. So what about you? Do you switch needle materials depending on the type of project you're knitting? I haven't up to this point, but I haven't used anything so slippery that I felt like I needed to switch, but perhaps in the future I'll invest in some, but I prefer metal needles personally. 
Teresa's question, how do you figure out how much yarn you hold back for sleeves when making a striped garment so the body and sleeve stripes match? My, is, my issue is using hand spun or hand dyed yarn that I only have a certain amount. Okay, this is a very detailed and involved thing. It's almost as if you're going to have to not design the sweater yourself, but you're gonna have to do some math here. I'm going to link a video below. It's basically how to use your swatch, your schematic and your measurements or your garment measurements or your own measurements well, no, the garment measurements to decide how much yarn you have to buy for a project. So you can use the same method to figure out the stripes, but it's going to take more work, especially depending on like if the stripes are, it's not evenly divided, but we're going to go with the premise that your stripes are evenly divided between two colors. So your first step, I wrote them down. I had to think about this one, make sure I had everything there, would be to swatch or if you've already started your project, you can use that as your swatch. So let's say you are knitting a sweater in pieces and you've finished the back, then you would lay it flat and you would measure the width of it and the length of it and multiply that number. That will give you your uh, one inch, your square inches. It'll give you your square inches. So you'll know how many actual square inches of fabric you've created. You can do that with a swatch. You can do that with the back of a sweater. Or if you are knitting in the round and you have the body of the sweater pretty much done, then you would take that number and you would double it because that would be the front for the front and the back if you did the length and the width. Um, but we'll go with just, let's say it's the sweater back because that's just a little bit easier. So you take the length and the width, multiply those numbers. We're gonna go with inches here. Um, and that would give you your square inches. And then you need to weigh that if you're using the swatch or if you're using that sweater back, you're going to get out your kitchen scale, whatever you use to weigh yarn, you're going to need it in this case. And you're going to weigh that garment. And I prefer to do this in grams. I just find it easier. So once you have the weight, you're going to divide the weight by the square inches. That will tell you how much weight of yarn, how many grams of yarn you used for each square inch in that fabric. Then you might need to do some estimation. So let's say you are, are working two colors and they are equal width stripes. So whatever that tiny little number, that grams, it could be like 2.3 or 0.23 or something really small per square inch we're talking here. That's how many grams for just one little inch. So let's say your stripes are absolutely equal. You're going to take that gram number and divide it in half. So that's what you'll need for each color. So once you've divided that, you now know the amount of yarn you need for one square inch of fabric. It might be, it's going to be a very small number, like 0.2 something or very small, most likely. Um, so now you can use this information to figure out how much yarn of each color. So say you're using two colors and the stripes are equal width for the fabric. So you're using the same amount. So you can take that little tiny number, divide it in half, and that's how much of one color that you're going to need per square inch of fabric. So at this point, you can take your sleeves and let's just say they're standard um, knit from the bottom up and standard increases to get that sort of triangly shape. If you think about the shape, if you lay one flat with the shoulder at the top and the wrist at the bottom, and then do the reverse with the other one, the wrist at the top and the shoulder at the bottom, you get sort of a rectangle shape. So you can take that measurement, like lay them to look at the schematic to get the measurements for the, the cuff and the shoulder and add them together. And that will give you the full width and then the length of the sleeve. So you would multiply those two numbers. That gives you the square inches of fabric that you'll be creating for the sleeves. So then you can multiply the square inches of that fabric by that number that you have for the grams of yarn needed for one square inch. You could either do the whole amount and then divide it between your stripes or do that half amount and that will tell you how much you need for that particular color. I know this is confusing. It's confusing even if you're figuring out for one color, but once you've done it a few times, it starts to get easier. It's, it's just basic math, you just, but you need to look at your schematic and the size that you're knitting and work out the square inches of fabric, weigh that garment or that swatch to figure out how much yarn you're using per square inch 
and then use that information to determine how much yarn you're going to need. So I'm going to link this video below so you can work through the process with, it's a Suzanne Bryan video, it's one of her knit alongs. I think, well, with the sweater I'm knitting, my cable sweater, I used her resources a lot to walk me through that and her yarn recommendations and everything like that, how to work all of this math out. So go watch that video. You don't have to do the whole sweater just to use the information in this and that will help you determine even if you're just knitting with one color, anybody else who wants to figure out how much yarn they need for a project, this is how you would do it to get a pretty exact amount. But when you're knitting stripes, then it's going to make any, it's going to be a little more difficult. And if your stripes are not even, then you're just going to have to estimate. Like if you just look at the fabric and, and decide, okay, then maybe only a quarter of my sweater has stripes, then you would take that um, one inch yarn amount, that little tiny decimal, and then you would just divide it up into however much yarn according to color that you think you need. I know that's a really involved answer and this is really, it's a, it's a more in-depth process so it's harder to just explain on here, but watch that video, it will walk you through it and hopefully that <laughs> you'll be able to work this out. If anybody has any advice for her on another way to estimate how much yarn she'll need for her stripes, then please leave a comment. And Layette's question, I have a project that is similar to finishing up a hat or a beanie. They demonstrate using three needles to seam it up. Have you ever knitted with three needles? Yes, this is called the three needle bind off, I think is what you're referring to. Um, you hold the, the finished project, it's still on the needles, those last few stitches or whatever. So you hold your two needles together in one hand so the, the stitches are all right there usually like the front and the back stitches, they're held parallel to each other. Then you use that third needle to just knit into both of them to, to finish off that final row and bind off at the same time. Personally, I like to use a crochet hook. I just find it much easier than a third needle. I just, it's just simpler for some reason for me. Might not be for you, try both and see how it works. The one thing to remember, and I always seem to forget this is if you want that, because that bind off is going to be, it's going to look like a thick seam. So you need to know whether that's supposed to be on the outside or the inside. If, if that little seam line is exposed, then you want the two pieces held together with the right sides of the fabric showing. But if that seam is supposed to be hidden, then you have to flip things inside out. So the right sides are together and the wrong sides are showing. For some reason, when I sit down to do this, I always seem to forget that and then I start realizing, oh yeah, my big bulky seams on the outside where I didn't want it on the outside. But yes, it's a, it's really an interesting, it's a great way to finish off something without having to do a graft or to like bind them off and then seam them together with mattress stitch. Three needle bind off is really nice. And the last question is from Rebecca. What's the absolute worst yarn you've ever used and couldn't be paid enough to try again? I couldn't think of any yarns in particular that I've purchased that I absolutely hated. I mean, I've knit with some itchy wools, but didn't mind that too much. I think maybe, I know it's gonna be weird, but I had a drops mohair yarn and I didn't love it. Like it felt scratchy to me. It just, I didn't like it, but I've never tried any other mohair. Maybe, maybe other mohair would be better. I don't know. But I think the worst yarn was probably when I first started knitting, somebody gave me like a bag of, it was just, it was really just cheap acrylic is all that was in there. And some of that was great. It was really soft and nice. And I used it for like some baby things for friends, things like that. Um, but some of it was, it was really like hard to knit with and it felt scratchy and I just did not like it. I did, I think I still have a few skeins of it over there. Actually, I was saving it to... Um, make some really thick eye cords that I can use for like teaching demo stuff. Just, I can't, I'm too frugal. I can't get rid of anything. Um, but for yarn, I've actually purchased myself. The only one I could think of was that drops mohair. And it wasn't like, I don't, I don't think I would never knit with again, but I just didn't really, it felt itchy to me. I know there's like the two camps of people who absolutely love all those brushed mohairs and alpacas and those that don't, but did have an alpaca one too. I don't remember if I found that one scratchy with the mohair I did. So it wasn't my favorite, but I think probably, yeah, the worst was that, oh, the, the cheap, cheap acrylic. You probably know what I mean. There's nice acrylic. Like I'm knitting my daughter one, like a, well, Knit Picks, their Brava is not, 
not very expensive, but it's a nice acrylic. It's really soft and it's nice to work with. And I'm really surprised with, I'll have to talk about more about that later. I'm really surprised with some of the things I'm doing with that project and it's working really well. It's very wool-like in the way it's acting. So I'm impressed with that acrylic yarn. That's it for knitting questions. If you have a question you'd love to have answered or discussed, please leave it down below and we'll discuss it in the next episode. And let's get into our knitting discussion. And this week it's all about animal fibers still. So we're moving on to a new one. We're going to discuss silk. So not any four-legged creatures walking around, but a little tiny silkworm. Now, I know a lot of people love brushed mohair and alpaca and that softness and fuzziness, but I'm not a fan for myself. I just I love the look of it, don't like the feel of it. But silk, I like silk. I love silk when it's blended with wool. It just has this beautiful sheen and drapiness and smoothness. I love th that smooth, smooth feel. So maybe it's a textural thing for me. I don't really love the texture of the fuzziness on, on myself. I like to look at it and I appreciate it, but it's not, not for me, but I love the smoothness that silk can provide. So silk can come from two different sources. It can be cultivated where silk worms, silkworms are fed a steady diet of mulberry leaves and mulberry silk is the most commonly found silk. It can also be cultivated from silkworms found in the wild, which produces a coarser silk fabric. So silk comes from the cocoon of the silkworm. So if you ever learned about how moths and butterflies grow and they have their different stages of development, silkworms create their cocoon and they nestle inside ready to become a moth. But it's that cocoon that is so precious that is made of filament threads that are coated in saracen that they wind themselves around to form their cocoon. This can get as long as 1600 yards. Now at this stage, this is when those cocoons are taken, they are boiled or heated and this kills the silkworm and it softens the saracen. And while it's wet, 30 to 50 filaments are gathered and twisted together into a single silk thread. Now this thread is then put into a hank before washing and bleaching and dyeing. So we get our silk from the silkworm cocoons. And they can also use broken cocoons. They treat it more like they do other animal fibers where they sort of, they have the shorter hairs, I guess. I mean, the cocoon, the pieces of thread and they turn that into fiber as well. It's just a slightly different process instead of like unwinding these large long cocoon threads. So the advantages of silk, it drapes well, it doesn't shrink or stretch very much. It's a good insulator. It's moth and mildew resistant. It absorbs moisture, it pro isn't prone to pilling, it has a rich luster and sheen, it's very smooth and it's exceptionally strong and it takes dye very well. But it does have some disadvantages. It's weaker when it's wet, prone to fading, it can be heavy and inelastic like plant fibers in that regard, and of course it's expensive. So silk is great on its own for accessories, um, or even garments, but you probably would want seams on your silk garments, or if it's very like a light tank top, you could probably get away without them. But because of that heavy inelastic nature, you want to give it some structure. I imagine, maybe not. I haven't knit with 100% silk. I like it when it's blended with, with wool. It's just really lovely. So I have a link down below that has more information about silk, how to care for it, lots of yarn recommendations. Now, before I show you what I've been working on, I just want to mention this episode's sponsor, which is Amazon's Audible. With the 30-day free trial of their Audible Premium membership, you can get two free audiobooks to listen to. I've been, I haven't been listening to any books lately, but I've been reading quite a few. I just finished the second book in the um, Shadow and Bone series. I don't know if you've seen that show on Netflix. I watched the show first. I binged it in just a few days. I watched the whole thing over the summer. And I then I, I, I just really like fantasy style things, as long as it's not very violent or graphic. And this one was good. I think it's geared more towards young adult, but I like young adult fiction too. So the show was great. And so I got the first book, Shadow and Bone. That one was really good. And I just finished the second one. I can't even remember the name of it now, but the second book in the series, and that one was really good too. And hopefully they'll make the next, they'll finish out. There's three books in the series, I guess, but there's lots of books in the the world of the, they call it the Grisha verse, I guess. Um, if you're familiar with the books or the movie, then you know. So if you like like fantasy style fiction with magic and things like that, then this is a really, they're interesting books. But anyway, that's enough about the sponsor. So if you want to try uh, some free audiobooks from and give Audible a try, then I'll have a link down below and you can get your two free audiobooks and a free month trial. 
So I am making progress on my master sweater. I finished adding the sleeves and I've started seaming. I finished the seam for one side of the body and the sleeve and I still have the other one to go. Just finishing the shoulders and that one seam took me, I think an hour and a half. So this is a long process. Well, the shoulders took a while too. I think that was over an hour just to get those shoulder seams done. Hopefully if I stay back, maybe the light won't be like as freaky as it was last week. So there it is. Which side? Okay, this is the side that's done. It's all seamed up. Oh, my light's acting weird. Try to stay back so it doesn't get all crazy looking. So we've got one side seamed. So you can see the stitch pattern I used here. That actually made it really easy to make sure the sides matched up perfectly because it's a two, a two row repeat. So I was always just looking at where I was in the stitch pattern to make sure I didn't miss a bar because I really want this to come out as good as possible. I wouldn't mind fudging it a little if it was for myself. Nobody's going to ever look up the seams on your sweater to see if they're just perfect. But for my master sweater, I want it to be as good as possible. And the same for the, the sleeve. Of course, I had increases. I used make ones one stitch in from the edge. So that kept me on track when I was seaming up the sides. If I was picking up right beside an increase on one side, I knew that I better be picking up the bar beside the increase on the other side. And that helped me seam perfectly. So I didn't end up having like a big gappy hole here where things weren't matched up right. So that side's done. And this side, the sleeve's attached. but I still have to seam up the top and the bottom. So after I finish seaming that up, that shouldn't take too long today, just the one side left. And then I just have to weave in all the ends and the neckline is the last thing to work on. And I'm not quite sure what to do with that. It's going to be a basic rib. I'm not gonna have any fancy um, stitches like I did on the, I did them on the cuff too. I did my cables right down the cuff, which I think came out really nice. I'm not gonna do like anything like that on the neckline itself. Okay, this is my adventurer wrap and scarf pattern from Amba O'Brien. This is the scarf size, slightly changed. It's slightly wider than her pattern. I added extra stitches, so it's going to be a little shorter, but you can see it's still pretty long. <laughs> so I've got four different colors. This is an Earth Yarns gradient set, four different colors, 200 grams of yarn all together. I'm on the last color, this lightest blue. So I've done my last bit of fading right here. So I have probably about a repeat or so. I think I'm working on finishing one repeat. I haven't quite finished and then I've got to go and do a full repeat. And then I think a few more rows to finish it off. I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough yarn for all of that but we shall see, but we're closing in on the end. And then I started weaving in some of the ends about halfway through or slightly less than half. So I still have some more ends to weave in, but it's looking good. It's almost done. Then I'm working on a design for uh, Biscot yarns or Le Lame Biscot here in Canada. They're based in Montreal, Quebec, using their Louise Robert or Louise Robert collection. This is a merino worsted, it's superwash yarn, very soft. The colorway is called oatmeal. So it's going to be a poncho when it's finished. Right now it's just a big long rectangle. So when it's finished, the bind off edge will be seamed to one side to create the poncho shape. And of course it's gotta be finished and then blocked. Simple repeat, just a four row pattern repeat. Three rows are just knit and purl and then one row with some yarn overs and increase and decreases to create the little lacy design. I cord edge, really simple. This is what I'm working on during the week. When I have a design on my needles, I try to spend most of my time working on that project because usually there's a deadline involved. This one is due in a few weeks. So I've been spending a lot of time working on this. The pattern is pretty much written already. So I'm just finishing up the sample right now. And then everything else, my personal projects, I save for the weekends, usually Friday to Sunday, I do the personal things. My master sweater, I have been working on that during the week as well, so I can get that finished. The seaming's taking a while. But when I have a design for somebody on my needles, it's usually my focus. So I've done a lot, it's almost finished. I should hopefully have it finished up this week. 
And also on my needles is a, a sweater for my daughter using a pattern in Amy Herzog's Ultimate Sweater Book. This is very similar to Ann Budd's Handy Book of Patterns books where you've got one design like this set and sleeve cardigan. This is what I'm knitting for her, making some changes to it as I go, but it comes in three different yarn weights, fingering, sport, and worsted. And, and I can't even, it was a lot of, of sizes. Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 10, 12 different sizes. So it's set up the same way as Ann Bud's books where you've got like charts and you pick the yarn weight you're using and the size and you just follow the numbers for that. So I've got them sort of circled in pencil so I can see where I'm at. But it's just a plain rectangle cardigan. There's no shaping or anything like that. So I started the back. Got a little bit done this weekend. I took it to church with me. <laughs> then I worked on it there during the sermon. Now I'm using Knit Picks Brava, which is an acrylic yarn and a sport weight yarn, the Brava Sport. <clears throat> and it's a really nice yarn. Um, the, now I did, let me see the cast on edge. I did something I hadn't tried before. Not sure if you can even tell on there, but I, it's a long tail cast on, but I did it in pattern so you don't get just the the swoopy lines you get them underneath your knit stitches but it looks more like a purl stitch underneath the purl stitches so it's not like that long tail cast on edge where you get that really smooth edge but i did it in pattern so it would look a little more invisible and that was new for me i'd never done the long tail cast on in pattern so of course i looked on youtube found a few videos and watched them to get an idea of how it was done and really simple not hard to do if you do the slingshot method for the cast on already then it's just switching you're instead of coming under the thumb and grabbing the yarn on your finger you're going the opposite direction basically you're going under the yarn on your finger to get to the yarn on your thumb to create sort of a purl stitch instead so that's coming along good oh and the second thing it's a two by two rib and you know how rib can look messy sometimes you've got that that knit before purl that always looks bigger than the other stitches and just they've got all the different techniques for fixing it you know tightening up when you're creating the purl or turning the twisting the yarn in the different direction all those things none of those work for me but Norwegian purl that method works for me but I usually save it for wool yarns because it really, it feels like it's really stretching out that stitch as you're working it. And wool has elasticity, so it will recover and keep its shape. So I'm not too concerned. I've tried it in plant fibers before and I hated working it because there's no elasticity like in a cotton yarn. So it's harder to work, it's hard on the hands and ribbing just doesn't look that great in those fibers anyway, I don't think. But I gave it a try with this because acrylic is supposed to be like your wool replacement from in most regards. I mean, all of them, they can be different based on how they treat the chemical fibers that they're creating. Um, but this yarn, I used the that Norwegian pearl technique, and I think it looks pretty good. I think it worked really well for this fabric. So I was surprised by that. I thought that it would be stretchy and messy, but I think it held up really nicely. So Norwegian Pearl used in Brava, Knit Picks Brava. Works good, makes a nice rib. So that's the best method for me. I've tried the other methods of cr trying to create neater ribs or you know that stitch before, the knit stitch before a pearl. But Norwegian Pearl works best in, for me. I mean, a lot of people, the other methods work just fine so they don't have to use the Norwegian Pearl, but the other methods didn't work for me. Okay, and the other thing with this is my gauge. My gauge was not, on on point with hers um, I think for the sport weight yarn she used a US 5 and my US 5 is being used for my scarf so I was too lazy to pull them out so I just grabbed a US 4 and I figured I'll check the fabric see if I like the fabric and the, I liked the fabric it was just fine took the measurements before and then I threw it in the washing machine and did the washer and dryer delicate cycle um, and my let me see my stitch gauge was one stitch less and two rows less over four inches but I was really high, I like the fabric. I think it's nice. I didn't feel the need to go up to a five. So what I did instead, this is a little trick you can do if you like the fabric, but your gauge isn't exactly right with the designer's gauge. I uh, decided how big a round I wanted the sweater to be. Like I've, I've measured my daughter and I used her bust measurement. So I know how much ease she wanted with her sweater. 
So I know how big the sweater should be, the measurement. So what I did with my, my uh, gauge is I took my one inch stitch gauge, multiplied it by the measurement for her final sweater that she wants. That gives me a rough stitch count. Now this works when there's no shaping involved. It's gonna probably, it might change if you've got shaping going on, but this sweater is just a basic rectangle. Start at the, the hem and you're knitting a rectangle, you know, some arm shaping and neckline shaping, but the body itself, no shaping going on. So the stitch count that I have when I cast on is the same stitch count I'm going to have at the bust, which is the largest part of the sweater. So I knew the stitch count, the rough stitch count that would give me the size I wanted. So all I had to do was go back to the pattern and look for the size that gave me the closest stitch count to what I had. So I'm just following the numbers for that size. And that way my row gauge isn't exactly the same as the individual pattern, but I'm still going to get a sweater the size I want using her pattern. Now this also works because the row gauge really doesn't matter because everything's listed in measurements. You know, like you cast on and you knit however many inches to the armhole and then you knit however many inches before you start doing your neckline shaping. So I would just use my own row gauge for that anyway. I don't lay things out to measure them. I might to like just to check and make sure everything's looking okay. But I use my row gauge to figure that out. So I know how many rows I have to knit before I start doing the, the underarm, like the, the arm shaping. So that is coming along nicely. So I actually have an acquisition to show this week. I won a giveaway last month and it just came in the mail this past week. The Irish Knitting Podcast here on YouTube. Sam's the host of that. He's from Venice, Italy, but he now lives in Ireland. He's a wonderful knitwear designer and knitter. His, his knitting is absolutely beautiful. He does lots of beautiful color work. And a recent project he did, he in, incorporates some of like designs based on Venetian things. So it's just really interesting to see. So I'll link to his podcast. You can check him out and I'll show you what I got from him. So he showed what was coming in the giveaway package when he was doing his giveaway on his podcast, but he threw in something a little extra. Now, Sam's also an artist and he sells his art on Etsy on the Irish Farm Shop. I'll put a link down below for that too. And he sent a print to me of these adorable geese. Isn't that so nice? I just need to go buy a frame and then I'm probably going to hang it on the wall behind me. I just think it's lovely. I love farm inspired art, so. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. Now, the first thing there was was this beautiful bag that he sewed. I like drawstring bags for my knitting and I love the print. I grew up in Maine, so I love ocean inspired things. I have a little project bag that has lobsters on it and that's usually in my purse with a little bit of knitting. So another ocean inspired bag. It's lovely and thick, really nice fabric. Now in this bag, there were three skeins of this beautiful green Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight yarn and the pattern to go along with them that Sam wrote, the Wicklow Mittens. And what's really funny is my father-in-law, I knit him some convertible mitts, your fingerless mitts with the tops that come over the mittens. And they're slightly too short, he says, like there's a gap between um, the mitten and the, the part that comes over. So I told him, well, I, I'll get your measurements and I'll knit you a new pair of mitts. So I think this is going to be for him. And I've even got the pattern. The Wicklow mitts are a convertible pattern too. And with that as well, some Knit Pro Zings. I've never tried Zings before. I have some other Knit Pro or Knitter's Pride, I think we call them here in Canada. I'm not sure. They have the two different names. Um, they're straight needles, but not, not these. So not their circular. So I'm looking forward to trying those as well. So, and a lovely little note. It was such a nice gift. January was a bit hard for us this month. I mean, we had COVID and then we had a couple household emergencies. So it was just after all of those things happened that I got an email from him saying that I had won. So I was very surprised and very happy. It was just a nice way to finish out a tough month. So that was a lovely gift. Thank you so much, Sam. Now we can't end an episode without talking about a knitting resource and this week's resource is Sweater Design in Plain English by Maggie Rigetti. She also has Knitting in Plain English which is another great book for new knitters. I don't own that one but I've seen it. I've gotten it from the library a few times and it's fabulous for newer knitters. It's a great resource. Now her books are very chatty. It's not like the Vogue knitting book where you're going to open it up, see lots of pictures and like little step-by-step, step, here's how to do this kind of thing. It's very conversational and chatty. I mean, there are charts and things like that, but it's mostly writing. 
and I mean it's sweater design so you're going to find math involved in here but her style is much more chatty and relaxed where like last week's book I showed you was uh, Knitting Pattern Essentials by Sally Melville. That one is much more structured with charts and math and all of the equations. You'll still find math in this one but it's more chatty and relaxed. That's the kind of vibe it has I guess. So if you want to design with the other one seems a little too overwhelming then this is another good recommendation for that. Um, the the designs, I mean, well, the pictures look very dated, but the, the principles are timeless. You know, you can still use the principles to design a sweater. Like the first half of the book is 17 chapters. That is just what you need to do before you begin, before you even design. Like understanding the lingo, pattern stitches, choosing colors, prep for designing, common knitting techniques, gauge, estimating the amount of yarn you're going to need. So that would be a good section to read, especially if you're doing stripes or something like that. So just estimating that yarn amount, like we discussed earlier when we were talking about knitting questions. And then the second half is about like different sweater designs. So you will find what she calls the tea topper and then something she calls a Da Vinci Man sweater, a boat neck beauty, V-neck pullover, cable classic, long sleeve, cardigan jacket, raglan turtleneck, adult raglan cardigan, lots and lots and lots, Icelandic yoke pullover, traditional Aaron Fisherman sweaters. So this book has more of the different sweater types, this, the constructions, that list I just read, that all of those different sweaters are included in here. Um, whereas in the Knitting Pattern Essentials, you only have like the basic shapes, like the drop shoulder set and sleeve, that kind of a thing, but covers it really well, but it doesn't have as many and it's all pieced sweaters, like in the Knitting Pattern Essentials, you're knitting the sweaters in pieces and seaming them. This one has more of both the varieties where you're knitting in the round as well, like the Icelandic yoke sweater and the pieced sweaters. So I like them both. I refer to them both when I'm knitting different things because um, you can find different ways of doing things or the different ways to estimate yarn or um, do the math you'll find different ways to do that. So I just like to have a variety of resources I can use. And then of course you always have the ones that help you the most or, or fit your style the most, I should say. So um, a, a good variety is always nice and well, books are always nice. Now, the last thing is the Fix Your Knitting Mistakes course. It's, I'm still leaving it open for anybody else that wants to join. And right now it's in like that first beta testing group. All of the videos are on there. I still have a bonus video to do. This week I've uploaded the final exam, which is a lace swatch. It's very simple lace, but then I walk you through how to drop down and fix a section in lace. And then a bonus edge stitches video as well. And I still have another bonus to add, but that will probably be a little bit down the road. It's more for like, short clips where you just need a quick reference and you don't want to watch a whole long video about something. Um, but you can still access the course. I'm leaving it open right now. Each section has like a sort of a little survey to complete just to make sure everything is explained well and covered well and I haven't missed anything. But in the final run of the course, when it's all completed, th those surveys won't be there anymore. It'll just be the course material itself. So if you want to provide input and have it at the lowest price it's ever going to be, um, then now is the time to jump in while we're still working with this first sort of beta group testing. But that is it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was lovely to chat with you and answer your knitting questions and share some of what's on my knitting needles. And if you're new here and you want to watch past episodes, I'll put a playlist right here and I'll see you in the next video.